Right, well, here we are. I found this piece on Reason.com. This is breaking news, or rather news. A male professor told a female professor a stupid joke. Now he faces disciplinary charges. A horrifying and chilling example of political correctness. Last month, Richard Ned Lebeau, a professor of political theory at King's College, found himself in a crowded elevator with Simona Sharoni, a professor of gender studies at Merrimack College, during an academic conference in San Francisco. Sharoni asked Lebeau what floor he needed. He replied, ladies lingerie. It was a stupid joke, a standard gag line. Lebeau later explained, according to the Chronicle of Higher Education. But Sharoni didn't think it was funny. And so she filed a complaint with the International Studies Association, whose conference they were both attending. An ISA committee found that Lebeau had indeed violated the group's code of conduct. Lebeau tried to resolve the matter himself, and wrote to Sharoni. He said he had no intention of making her feel uncomfortable, but stopped short of a full apology. According to the Chronicle, Like you, I am strongly opposed to the exploitation, coercion, or humiliation of women, Lebeau wrote. As such evils continue, it seems to me to make sense to direct our attention to real offenses, not those that are imagined or marginal. By making a complaint to ISA, that I consider frivolous and I expect will be judged this way by the Ethics Committee, you may be directing time and effort away from the real offenses that trouble us both. But describing Sharoni's complaint as frivolous made the committee even angrier. Lebeau was subsequently instructed to issue an unequivocal apology. He has refused to do so and could face disciplinary charges. In his mind, the episode is a horrifying and chilling example of political correctness that encourages others to censor their remarks for fear of retribution. Sharoni, for her part, said that she cannot remain silent when misogyny is at play. The Washington Post's Ruth Marcus offered this opinion, which seems right to me. This episode reflects not only a generational and cultural divide, but also the unfortunate intersection of two prickly personalities with the bad luck to be stuck in the same elevator. She shouldn't have leaped to file a grievance. He shouldn't have added fuel by labeling her charge frivolous. Nonetheless, count me with Lebeau. The days of women feeling compelled to stay silent in the face of sexist remarks or conduct are thankfully on the way out. Hear something, say something, by all means, but for goodness sake, let's maintain some sense of proportion and civility as we figure out how to pick our way through the minefield of modern gender relations. Not every comment that offends was intended that way, and intent matters. Maybe check in with the speaker before going nuclear. Maybe consider that there is a spectrum of offensiveness. That not every stray statement by a 76-year-old man warrants a resort to disciplinary procedures. A misguided elevator joke certainly seems like something two adults could have handled on their own without formal investigation and the threat of sanction. Of course, that uh, completely goes out the window when people get their panties in a wad, especially about lingerie jokes. Yeah. This is actually a very unfortunate situation, because on one hand, pretty much every single guy can at least see why this joke happened. I mean, it was low-hanging fruit. It's, it's a very, very old joke that, at least at one point in history, might have gotten a laugh from pretty at least half of the population. Uh, maybe more. I mean, I think that my wife would uh, consider that kind of a joke incredibly funny. At least if told by somebody that she knew and trusted. Or that she knew was 
actually joking and not actually a dirty old man or something. I indeed, uh, I've made far worse jokes myself in polite company, but the polite company knew what kind of a person I was, knew that I didn't have any ill will, and took my words for what they were worth, rather than too much at face value, which would have been a disaster for me. Now, there's something about inappropriate behavior that I learned from my grandmother a long time ago. It's that if you're wrong, own up to it. And however simple this may seem, it's actually really difficult. The, the syntax is very simple. Realize that you're wrong. Admit it. Correct the problem. One, two, three, done. But admitting that you're wrong when you did something that is on the border. I mean, like murder, that's wrong. Rape, that's wrong. Theft, that's wrong. Uh, lewd comments, that's a lot contingent upon the situation. But we'll go and say lewd comments, wrong. Impolite at the very least. If for no other reason, he should have apologized for being impolite if he wanted to de-escalate the situation. Which is interesting because I'm looking at an apology as generally a utilitarian kind of a thing. Because going and, and saying I'm sorry doesn't really do too much for me, per se, but it does an awful lot for the person that I'm saying I'm sorry to. It prevents the relationship or any future interactions from going into the toilet any more than they already have maybe. Or at least it can kind of put the brakes on on that particular process. You know, apologizing is, in the right context, a very Machiavellian thing to do. Because if, if we're going to be open about this, I don't know how sorry he actually was. He's probably sorry that the situation blew up in his face. And he learned he's not going to do it again. So technically, you can say, I'm sorry. I won't do this again. And that's all that needs to be said. It sounds even better if you say, I'm sorry, I didn't have any excuse. And I will never do this again. Or, I'm sorry, I disrespected you. I didn't have any excuse. I thought I was making a joke, but clearly I was out of line. Please forgive me. That would almost certainly have stopped the situation. But instead, we're left with the laundry joke that left Simona's panties in a wad. So, what did he do? He said... Instead of apologizing, he said that, or he implied that his offense was imaginary or marginal, which by definition, by his very choice of words, showed that he emotionally marginalized the impact of his words. Now, whether he's right or wrong in them, I mean, I still think that the joke was funny. But, he left someone feeling emotionally marginalized, which is not the way to make friends. You do not emotionally marginalize anybody, no matter how similar or different you are from that person. Because the more emotionally marginalized they feel, the more of an enemy they will become. So, you are saying that it's fake because he's talking about direct our attention to real offenses. So, obviously, this is not a real offense. Well, certainly it felt real to her. And even if it didn't feel particularly real, 
she's going to be justifying making her complaint. So it's going to she's going to make it feel more real. She's going to rehash it and rehash it and rehash it until it winds up becoming an even bigger issue. Uh, it's going to become less imaginary, even though it is her imagination that's going through the whole thing and making it more and more visceral every time she goes through it. And then he goes and he says that the complaint is frivolous. So not only are you imagining things, not only is this marginal, not only is this not real, but the fact that you're making a big deal about it and wasting other people's time, that's frivolous. Don't say that. If ever you get yourself into that kind of a social situation, don't say that. Don't do that. I'm sorry. I was disrespectful. I made an inappropriate joke. And I won't do it again. I had no excuse. But then... When he was instructed later to issue an unequivocal apology, that doesn't work. Because now the apology is no longer coming from him. No matter what he says, goodwill ain't going to happen between the two of them for a long time unless something else occurs to make the situation better. If you have to be told by somebody to apologize, it's just like the the kiddo on the playground that pushed the other kid off the swing set. You push the other kid off the swing set, your mom observes, drags you to the other kid and says, say I'm sorry to Jimmy. I'm sorry, Jimmy. Yeah, right, the kid's sorry. See, enforcing morality in that kind of a way is a pathetic way that shouldn't even be done to preschoolers. Except for that you should convince the preschooler, show that the actual action was wrong, get them to realize it, and from that point make their apology. Like even if they disagree with it, they at least need to realize the ramifications of their actions and make a sincere apology based upon that. And you don't even need to feel a particular way in order to make a sincere apology. You just need to resolve to not engage in that behavior again. And if the behavior is actually wrong, then it would make sense to make that apology. But now let's go and look at the reaction of Simona Sharoni. She went overboard. She got so much on her moral, emotional high horse that she neglected to remember she was dealing with a human being. You know, there's there's this attitude that the first thing that we ever, first time we ever see anything, we just go to the authority. Whatever the authority happens to be at any given place, just go to it. Let them solve the problem. She admitted that she was weak. In doing this, she admitted that she didn't have the guts to deal with this on a one-on-one -on -one basis. I mean, both of these people have demonstrated a severe lacking in interpersonal skills. I mean, I may personally often come across as a jerk, but I don't alienate people when I meet them face to face. People actually like me face to face. But in my writing, sometimes in my videos, people go and look at me as, oh, this guy might not be the nicest guy, but I'm friends with many people on the left. I'm friends with many people I vehemently disagree with about all sorts of things. Why? Because there is an environment of mutual respect. And I'm constantly working on establishing that emotional stability that is the grounds for all of the other positive things that can happen in a relationship. If you're not starting from an emotionally stable place, you're not generating that foundation for everything else to be predicated upon, it ain't going to work. 
So if there's anything to be learned from this entire situation, it is don't do anything that makes someone not feel safe. Second, don't do anything that marginalizes someone else, especially something that marginalizes someone else's feelings. Feelings are feelings. They are a barometer. They do not, they are not reality. They're merely one way of gauging reality. That would be like, uh, well, marginalizing someone's feelings would be like marginalizing someone's sight. You didn't really see that. You don't, you should really shouldn't feel that. You really shouldn't have seen that. No, you can't do that. You can validate the feeling without going down the pit of acknowledging that the person is 100% right in everything. So, help the person feel safe. Don't marginalize the person. In other words, help the person have a sense of belonging with you. And thirdly, whatever matters to that person needs to at least in some way matter to you. You can be completely on the opposite side of things as that person. I'm on the right. And I think that many leftist ideas, many implementations are evil. I think that many of them come from a an authoritarian position. I think that many of them come from the, 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 the position of wanting to put an authority in that validates exactly what it is that I do and forces everyone else to validate it too. So I don't like leftism for that reason. But still, I, I understand, uh, at the very least, I understand what leftists are, are trying to get. And I would say an awful lot of leftists are actually leftists because they don't know what leftism truly is. They don't know what socialism truly is. You know, there are these uh, idealistic, hopeful minds that have yet to deal with some harsh realities that the world actually has to show. And so, if you want to deal with people like that, you have to use number one and number two, the feeling safe, the feeling of belonging, to be able to show people that, hey, you know, this whole, this whole leftism thing, this whole feminism going over the top kind of a thing, you know, past the point of equality to the point where, you know, it's, it's culturally appropriate for women to go and belittle men and nobody bats an eyelid. And at the same time, men can't make a lingerie joke without having it blow up in their face and being forced to uh, issue an unequivocal apology or face disciplinary charges. No, I don't like these double standards, and I don't think anyone sane does. And then you get into this whole, well, not all leftists are like that. Well, if, if that is a leftist position, then, then yes, all leftists are. And, um, well, I think that leftists should consider whether or not they're leftists or liberals. Because there's a big difference. I can get along really, really well with liberals, even with modern-day liberals. The left is just plain old evil. Leftist ideology is evil. And people will eventually come to that conclusion on their own. It just takes time. It takes life. So being patient with people and helping them accomplish their goals in as much as it's part of your thing. Like if you're going to a conference with somebody then stick to the subject of the conference. You know, if you're going out afterward for dinner or drinks or whatever it is that people go out and do at conferences, 
then yeah, it might be all right to, to, to loosen up a bit, but still stick within the bounds of what is socially acceptable for any given set of circumstances. I mean, I might be a little old-fashioned because I'm using 19th century um, principles to guide a lot of my behavior. Of course, I've gone and updated a lot of it depending upon what it is that I've seen in this world and what I've seen based on any cultural circumstance here or there. But you really can't go wrong with old manners. People might think that you're a little stuffy, old-fashioned, but it's certainly better to be stuffy and old-fashioned than to lose people's goodwill from the very first words that come out of your mouth. And so if there's anything to be learned about this, I can boil it down to two things. One, help people feel safe around you. Two, take a deep breath and don't get your panties in a wad when somebody says something that induces an emotional reaction. Take the time to cool off a little bit before you react. That is all for today. Thank you.